At least once each week, throughout the year, more than 100 new graduates of the infantry's non-commissioned officer candidate course gather in Marshall Auditorium at Fort Benning, Georgia, to receive well-earned ranks of either Sergeant E-5 or Staff Sergeant E-6. Similar scenes occur at other service schools throughout the United States. The speaker on this occasion is James A. Scott, Command Sergeant Major of the Candidate Brigade, veteran of Korea and Vietnam, and spokesman for the enlisted men. Since November 1967, when the pioneer class of this new training program filled the same rows of seats in the same auditorium, several thousand other NCOC graduates have followed them into the troubled areas of the world. Their reputation as some of the finest junior non-commissioned officers in the United States Army was quickly established. From the demilitarized zone of Korea to the delta of the Mekong River in South Vietnam. A few weeks ago, these men were reporting to their candidate company for in-processing and assignment to student platoons. To qualify for admission into the non-commissioned officer course, each candidate must satisfy certain requirements. He must have a security clearance of confidential, an infantry aptitude score of 100 or higher, and he must have completed advanced individual training. Prior to entering the course, a prospective candidate must be a grade of E4 or below. The prospective candidate is selected for the course by his previous unit commander, who has based the selection on the soldier's demonstration of leadership potential. The candidate must have 13 or more months remaining service obligation upon completion of the course. In addition, he must be qualified for overseas assignments. And finally, he must be a high school graduate or the equivalent, or have achieved an aptitude area general test score of 90 or above. If an incoming candidate is accepted for the course, he will be promoted to Corporal E4 with its pay and advantages. On the first day of classes, he will be welcomed to the course by his respective battalion commander. The Infantry NCOC course offers three separate programs of instruction. Each program has been designed to qualify graduates for a particular military occupational specialty. Four out of five candidates entering NCOC classes at Fort Benning follow the 11 Bravo program, which develops future leaders of infantry fire teams, rifle squads, and even platoons. Other candidates will attend the 11 Charlie program, which turns out highly qualified, indirect fire, non-commissioned officers. The third course offered by the infantry school is the 11 Foxtrot program, which trains candidates to be infantry operations and intelligence specialists. All three programs begin with a training sequence referred to as phase one, which concentrates on the development of individual skills. Phase one allows each candidate to build a solid foundation for the more advanced group training that will subsequently follow. Each candidate engages in physical exercise that will strengthen his muscles and develop endurance. The Ranger obstacle course builds his confidence and helps to sharpen his reflexes.
candidate practices the four fundamentals of hand-to-hand -hand combat and the basic positions and movements of bayonet fighting. The candidate learns to employ a compass and to read a map. These soon become indispensable tools of his trade. The extensive training given in land navigation will be vital in the performance of his duty as a combat leader. Through practice, he masters the M16 rifle, the M79 grenade launcher, as well as other weapons of the rifle platoon. A brief refresher on assembling and disassembling, cleaning and simple maintenance is also integrated into weapons training. The candidate gains a more extensive working knowledge of the communications equipment which is used by the rifle squad, platoon, and company. Crucial to the candidate's prospective NCO role is knowledge of medical evacuation operations and the care of wounded personnel. The candidate must know the techniques used to call a medevac helicopter. It is essential that he also learn how to ensure that wounded personnel are evacuated swiftly with the least possible aggravation to their wounds. A substantial portion of the candidate's academic day is also spent in the classroom. Map reading, combat intelligence, and other instruction is introduced. Then techniques are discussed for their practical application in the field. In addition, there is an hour of required study hall every evening for which each candidate has been assigned a desk near his bunk. Here he must effectively utilize his time preparing for the next day's instruction, as well as reviewing previous lessons. But all this learning by studying, doing, and listening is only secondary to the major purpose of an NCO course. That purpose, to encourage and develop those qualities that add up to real leadership in the finest tradition. During phase one, all candidates are given the opportunity to put these qualities to the test in a series of 16 different leader reaction exercises. After warning a team that it will be disqualified if it runs out of time, the rating officer explains the problem, appoints a team leader, then gives the go-ahead signal. The five-man team has to get a supply cart across a mock setup which represents a raging river and the abutments of a destroyed bridge. The team leader must solve the problem quickly. Yet he knows he must remain calm, not get overexcited. He has to make sure his team gets the job done within the set time limit. Prodded and prompted by the good-natured jeers and cheers of their classmates, the team goes to work. It's a team effort, and that's how the task must be and is accomplished. As the student candidates conclude this period of general subjects training, the 11 Bravo program goes on to phase two, which concentrates on techniques of fire and small unit tactics. Particular emphasis is placed at the squad and fire team level.
With the emphasis shifting from individual to group activities, each candidate has plenty of opportunity to learn what it takes to be a real leader. He can observe leadership traits displayed by his fellow candidates as he serves under each of them in various exercises of simulated events. Also, he can put his own leadership to the test when his turn comes to take command of a mission, such as this one, the attack of an objective with live fire. The infantry leader must be equipped to cope with the problems created by each situation, the crossing of a stream, night operations, perimeter defense as employed in counter guerrilla operations. He learns through experience how to analyze a mission. How to take best advantage of the terrain. How to study the enemy situation. How to develop a well-timed course of action. and how to direct and supervise this action once it is underway. Each candidate's actions are carefully evaluated as they come under the keen eyes of a professional observer. At the same time that 11 Bravo began phase two of their program, the 11 Charlie class moves on to the second phase of their course, the study of 81 millimeter mortars. It covers all the important aspects of this indirect fire weapon, from assembly and emplacement, to crew drill, to forward observation, and to operating a fire direction center. This culminates with an actual live firing exercise. While the 11 Bravo and 11 Charlie programs are in progress, the 11 Foxtrot class continues with phase one. From the fifth week on, the 11 Foxtrot course places its candidates in a series of classes, discussions, and field activities. These exercises progressively train them to be highly qualified operations and intelligence non-commissioned officers. The 11 Foxtrot candidates learn, among other things, how to organize an intelligence section at brigade or battalion level for 24-hour combat operations. They learn how to prepare the intelligence annex to a combat order. How to maintain a situation map. Or how to construct a tactical operations center. At the halfway point of the NCOC course, based on six weeks of constant close association, each candidate rates the relative leadership qualities of the 30 to 40 men in his own student platoon. In the meantime, the tactical non-commissioned officer of each candidate platoon makes his own leadership rating of the men directly under his personal supervision. Tactical non-commissioned officers of the NCOC course are all experienced leaders 
and each of them has been carefully selected for the exacting responsibilities that go with his position at the school. Each candidate is assigned to a tactical non-commissioned officer for the period he is in the course. The candidate looks upon the tactical NCO as an example of what he eventually hopes to become. Candidates know the non-commissioned officer is always there, always observing their work, their habits, their general attitude and behavior. They know he thinks of them as individuals. Tactical NCOs can understand and appreciate what makes each candidate react as he does to the physical and mental stress, the trials and opportunities of the NCO program. Each candidate knows that if he does not progress satisfactorily, the tactical NCO will be there for assistance and to guide him in the proper direction. Candidates are rotated at regular periodic intervals during a formal change of command ceremonies into platoon and company leadership positions. This is done by the tactical NCO so that he can observe their leadership potential and demonstrated ability. Each candidate is afforded the opportunity to function as a leader and to deal with the problems which accompany the responsibility of his rank. Candidates know the NCO is always prepared, always available to teach them on any subject. Instructing candidates in proper methods and techniques is an essential part of the tactical NCO's job. The most important responsibility, however, that a tactical non-commissioned officer has is to guide and develop each candidate's leadership qualities to help each candidate accomplish his goal that of becoming a leader of men. Thus, through counsel, example, training, practice, and field experience, candidates of the NCOC course prepare themselves for their final challenging weeks at Fort Benning. The 11 Charlie candidates must learn to master the 4.2-inch heavy mortar. They do so by repeated drill with this important infantry weapon. By use of the M2 compass. And the aiming circle. By the study of ballistics. by mechanical training, forward observation, extensive mortar fire direction center procedures, and firing on the range. While the indirect fire candidates are mastering their weapon, the 11 Bravo candidates are well underway in their own vitally important phase of training. The dress rehearsal for actual combat that takes place during the last three weeks of the course in the woods, the swamps, and near jungle conditions. The final phase of the 11th Bravo program is built along the lines of the U.S. Army's Ranger Corps. Candidates are told they will face situations duplicating those of actual combat. Ranger Week, as it is called, consists of extensive night and day patrolling and counter guerrilla training in the field under conditions of stress and hardship. 
Here, for example, tired candidates move to establish required patrol bases. These bases allow the candidates a brief rest before they push on. Training during Ranger Week is designed to test the candidate's endurance and his resourcefulness. The unrelenting trials force the candidate to become almost completely self-sufficient. Candidates have to purify the water they drink. And since portions of the Ranger course, like many combat areas, are inaccessible by road, the candidates must push ahead to rendezvous points. Here they receive their sea rations and other supplies by helicopter. And so for nearly 200 hours, the candidates are put to the test. For them, there is little or no let up. They have to be ready for surprise attacks, for unexpected aggressor patrols who have been trained to fight in the style of Viet Cong guerrillas. also contend with other platoons or squads of fellow candidates with neither side knowing of the other's existence. This advancing patrol, for example, is pitted against another group of men who have been placed in ambush to guard the approaches to a hidden cache of supplies. It is through this kind of intensive training that candidates relate to their future roles as combat leaders. When the 11th week is behind them, the NCOC candidates are in the home stretch. It is at this time that they are afforded an opportunity to question a panel of recently returned combat veterans. No matter how thoroughly they are trained, candidates always want to add to their knowledge and learn from the experience of others. In the 12th week, there is a final leadership rating by both candidates and tactical NCOs. Prior to graduation, an impartial panel determines which candidates have earned the rank of Staff Sergeant E6. This determination is based on recommendations from the battalion commander, the company cadre, and the candidate's testimony. The panel also determines which candidates have not met the minimum standards for graduation and promotion to Sergeant E-5. Twelve weeks ago, these new sergeants came to Fort Benning with little conception of what it meant to bear the responsibility for men in combat. Those who now cross this stage know they have passed the test. They have shown qualities of tactical knowledge and true leadership that will enable them to command the respect afforded a leader. Knowledge and leadership, qualities that will help their country in time of need, qualities they will put to excellent use in endeavors throughout their lives.